Good morning, Trinity Church. Welcome. We're in the middle of December. Let's stand together as we sing familiar Christmas carols, worship the Lord. This song is comes out of the Psalms where it, we rejoice that, that the Lord of all the earth will come, and we know that he has come, and that he will come again. And so that brings joy. And so let's rejoice this morning as we worship together. so good to be together. Will you say good morning to one another before you're seated? Good morning, Trinity. Good morning. How are you? Um, my name is Michael Burns, and I'm up here to do this. So here we are. Um, Christmas is in 10 days. Yeah. Hope and joy and stress. And I might have been setting up my Christmas lights last night in the drizzle. But they're up now, so this is good. Um, thank you. Well, yeah, see? I, 
I appreciate that. Um, we are so glad that you're here this morning on what can be a stressful time, a busy time, but, but such a wonderful time. And you're here because we know what Christmas is all about, and we want to we want to rejoice in that. Right? If you are new with us today, uh, we would love for you to, to reach in front of you, the, the seat back in front of you, and take out the new card. Okay? And if you put your information on that so that we can uh, follow up and get to know you a little better, then you can take that card and you can go right outside to the, the Start Here booth and you can give that card to those folks and they will trade it for a voucher that then you can take just a little bit further down and get some coffee on what is kind of a surprisingly cold morning this morning. So this is perfect. You give us a little bit of your information, we promise not to stalk you much, and then you get coffee and life is good for everybody. Okay, So please uh, do that with us today. Oh, and also in the seat back in front of you, there is a prayer card. And we're all about prayer here. Okay, We know that no matter what is going on in your life, um, the answer is God. Okay, And we want to be on your team and we want to pray alongside you and um, on your behalf and let uh, be with you in, in before the Lord. So take that prayer card, fill out what you uh, would like us to pray about and drop it in the offering as it comes by. Right? Now we do have some information coming up on uh, some things that are coming our way in the weeks ahead. First up, we have the men's trap shoot. Okay, That will be on December 26th at, as you can see, Redlands Shooting Park. This is fantastic, guys. Once you've made it through Christmas, you're, you're going to want to blow stuff up. <laughs> and this is your chance. You get to go out there and you get to, it'll be it'll be fantastic. Okay, so the cost is $40. Uh, you can show up. They have rental equipment. It's all it's all there for you. Uh, so come along and, and play. All right. And then also a little later into January, we have Financial Peace University, which is a class that we will be offering uh, on Sundays. You can see here the information, and there's also information in your Trinity this week, so that'll be a, a reminder for you. You will uh, register online. You go to Trinity Online, and uh, you can register for that. It is a little bit of a cost. It's $110, but this is, this is your chance, really, to, uh, to take back your finances, okay? Every year, I don't know about you guys, but for me, every year it was like, okay, this is the year. This is the year I'm going to get it straightened out. This is the year I'm going to get rid of the debt. Uh, this is the year I'm going to be squared away and be able to live and give uh, the, the way that I've wanted to, okay? So maybe this is the year for you. Come and learn the, the tools that you're going to need to get you to the place that, that you want to be, okay? We are all re also rejoicing today with our, our global workers, the shoemakers, okay? So uh, there's information about them in your Trinity this week. But Jonathan and Tracy Shoemaker are ministering um, on God's behalf and to his people in Portugal. And they have shared with us some pretty awesome things that have happening. I guess they headed up a, a uh, vacation Bible school over the summer that Trinity helped support. And they saw three people come to Christ. Okay? Pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. This, is, this is why they do what they do, right? And this is why we support them. People who didn't know Jesus now know Jesus because of the work that they're doing. And that is just beyond fantastic. Um, and they want you to know that about that. They also want you to know about another cool thing God has done. They have managed to get office space for, for one of their team leaders. They're in the community that they're serving. So they've got somebody right there in the community um, in a business where they're able to, to meet needs and, and impact people. So we're, we're pretty excited about that. And, and we invite you to pray um, to pray for them. As a matter of fact, we're going to pray right now. Why not? Pray with me, please. Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you that in the middle of the busyness and the craziness um, of this time, that you remain God and that you've called us to this place right here, right now, this morning, so that we can rejoice in all that you've done for us. We rejoice with the shoemakers of the way that you've blessed them. And we, re we rejoice with the way that you've blessed this world with your son. Father God, we are yours this morning. And we ask that you would be pleased with our praises and that you be glorified in this day. And God's people said, amen. amen. All right, let's continue to worship.
I'll stand as we sing this next song. Christmas Day to 
an age of silence, of doubt, of questioning promises. Yet something is stirring. Like a light in the darkness, hope arises. As the sun breaks through the night, a new day is upon us. The moment where everything changes. The birth of our Savior brings a thrill of hope. Hope of salvation. Hope of an eternal life with our eternal King, where all things are made new. All right, Trinity Church, how you doing? Good to see you. Happy Sunday and Merry Christmas. We are right around the corner and just a little over a week and a half before we get there with Christmas Eve services. I've got some more to tell you about that in just a minute, but I want to welcome you here in the worship center. For those of you out on the pavilion and watching online, a uh, very Merry Christmas to you as well. Well, a couple things uh, to kind of get us started today. We are in a series about Christmas called The Thrill of Hope. This is kind of what we've been focused on since we started this month. Had a great children's musical last weekend that was very rich and hope that was good for you. And I saw so many people that you invited, so thank you for just using that as a really great entry point opportunity. But let me tell you a little bit of what we're doing today. In your notes, you have some notes that look like these that'll help you track with us. If you have a Bible today, you can open it up to Luke chapter 2. Luke is the third book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Luke 2 is kind of where we'll kick off today as we uh, dive in. As you're doing that, let me give you a couple different things that are going on. First off, wanted to give you the great news that when it comes to Advent conspiracy, you fully funded it. Can we praise God for that? I absolutely love to just brag on Trinity Church when it comes to the Advent Conspiracy. We receive a special offering for $45,000 that we simply give away. And we love to get to partner with the different projects here locally and around the world that uh, our whole missions team has done a great job of identifying. We're so grateful for that. So that's all going to start happening. We'll give you updates throughout the year as those projects and things get um, really just kind of experienced. But thank you very much for your generosity. Also, we talked about Christmas Eve a minute ago. Um, at every exit today, we have a card that looks just like this, that they were in our Trinity this week, last week, they're available, or our program actually, for our musical. They're available everywhere. And this is really the way we think of Christmas Eve, there are people in your relational world who really want next to nothing to do with God or church, but going to church on Christmas has been a thing. It's just been something they've been about maybe since they were little or, or they're just open to holiday things, whatever it might be. We would love for you to be prayerfully considering who you could invite to come with you on Christmas Eve. And on the front, just the, the design, the graphic, but on the back, all the details. One thing we're doing, uh, I love that we're kind of growing in this area is also through the way you could share that digitally. So maybe take a note on our website, trinityonline.org. This is how you get to our website. Then a backslash and the word share. That's all it is. Trinityonline.org backslash share is a way that you can actually take this image and some other ones that our communications team has developed and be able to share them to Instagram, share them to Facebook. You can even text them as an invite to someone to come because we just know that Many of us live in that digital world. We want to give you resources and tools that will really help you do that as well. So whether it's pick one up at the back today and hand this to someone this week and just say, hey, I'd love for you to join me at Christmas Eve at my church, or if you want to send something digitally, you've got those uh, resources available to you. And we would love to get to meet people from your world who maybe have never been to Trinity before to come and see this great news of hope that we're going to get to talk about on Christmas Eve. Also, I want to give you an update on one of the things related to our staff. It's uh, with some sadness that we mentioned that Larry Shoemaker is retiring next month at the end of January. And, um, and he's just an amazing job, been on staff with us for 17 years, but been at Trinity for decades and been before that a career with Campus Crusade. And so his retirement is coming up. He's not dying, so don't be too bummed. But, um, but I know you loved Larry deeply because of the way he 
has shepherded and ministered to you in so many ways. Here's what I want you to do. Save the date. You can write this down. Saturday, January the 25th, we're going to have uh, just a great event here in the worship center celebrating Larry and Karen. And if you know Larry, you know how much Karen is involved in loving people as well as he does and just shepherding them well. So really something to honor them both on Saturday the 25th from 3 to 5 in the afternoon right here. We'll give you some more news about that in coming uh, weeks, but wanted you to have that on your calendar. Make sure you come and join us that day. Well, we are in this series called The Thrill of Hope, and what we've been talking about is we mentioned two weeks ago when we started the series that embedded within the concept of hope is waiting. And we go back to thinking about when we were kids, many of us for Christmas, what really made Christmas Christmas was the anticipation of what was under that tree for you. And, and as we're walking out this series, we began a couple weeks ago talking about just the necessary reality of having to wait for hope. We basically talked about what was it like the day before Jesus arrived. Today, we move that story a little bit further, and we actually get to talk about the incredibly great news that Jesus did arrive. And not only did he arrive, but he lived this sinless life. He died a sacrificial death. He was raised supernaturally on the third day. And we get to talk about what Jesus accomplished, and that truly, in that sense, hope has been realized. We're going to talk a little bit. If you look at even the top of our notes today, our title is Hope Realized But Delayed. And we're going to talk about a little bit what does that mean to have Jesus do what he did 2,000 years ago, but know that we ourselves are also looking forward with hope, not to his first arrival, but to his second. And we're going to talk about that tension a little bit today that we live in, and my hope is to just provide some really helpful tools to you wherever you're at on that spectrum. But a couple weeks ago, I introduced to you the biggest story, this book, and many of you were asking me about it. I'm going to hold it nice and still. You can read the title, Kevin DeYoung, Amazon. I don't get any kickback when you buy this book, okay? But I wanted to read for you a, new, a few more pages because he just does a great job, and you'll see these pages illustrated up on the screen. You can follow kind of along. This is the next part of the story where we left off a couple weeks ago. It says, after all these downs, and remember, we talked about, man, the, the people of Israel just kept missing what God was trying to do. After all these downs and not too many ups, we come to a manger in the little town of Bethlehem. This is where we meet the new Adam, the child of Abraham, the son of David. It's with the stinky shepherds and the singing angels where we see the real deliverer, the real judge, the real conqueror. No one understood it completely at the time, but when Mary pushed out that baby, God pushed into the world the long-expected prophet, priest, and king. God gave his people a new law, a new temple, and a new sacrifice. Best of all, he gave his people a new beginning, and watch this, just as he had promised. Of course, some things were different than people had expected, the stable with the animals and the scandal with unmarried Mary were surprises to most folks. The miracles were remarkable. The teaching was unlike anything anyone had ever heard. The bumbling band of hand-picked disciples, well, that was just curious. But the biggest surprise to everyone was that the chosen one of God was chosen by God to die. It just didn't seem right that the one destined to crush the serpent would be crushed himself. So when Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God, died on the cross that Friday afternoon, it seemed a shocking evil beyond belief. And it was the worst thing that's ever happened in the world. But it was also the best thing that's ever happened in the world, just as we would expect from God and just as God planned it. You see, we break promises so God keeps his. We run from God so he comes to us. We suffer for sin so the Savior suffers for us. Our story is the story of God doing what we can't in order to make up for us doing what we shouldn't. The Christ suffers for our sin that we might share in his sinlessness. And so deliverers are born to die. Things fall apart so that they can come together. God kicks his own people out of paradise and then does whatever it takes to bring them back. 
This is the hope that we're going to talk about today, the hope presented in the great news of the gospel. And what I want to draw your attention to is what happens once you've responded to that invitation? How do you live in the in-between time? In your uh, notes today, this is our now what idea. It's on the screen and it's there. Realize that Jesus came not only to be your Savior and Lord, but also to be the source of your life. I'll explain that in just a minute. Your Bibles are open to Luke chapter 2. Look in your notes. Jesus arrived and fulfilled God's promise to send the snake crusher. I told you I love that title. It comes from Genesis 3. At the very beginning, when God's two first people decided we're going to do our own thing, God said from the beginning, I'm going to send one who's going to come and crush the head of the snake. So from the very beginning, Genesis 3, God promised and that's part of what Jesus, the, the titles and the names and the promises and the prophecies that all were embodied in Jesus, snake crusher was one of them. I just think it's so profound. Luke chapter two is where your Bibles are open, verses 25 to 32. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. That's a fascinating phrase. Consolation of Israel simply means when God was going to make good on his promises. He was eagerly anticipating that. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and he praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Just imagine in that moment, Simeon, an older gentleman, he's been serving the Lord as a priest probably all of his life, and God had revealed to him, Simeon, in your lifetime, your very eyes will see me making good on the hope that I have given people all along. So this is powerful. He realizes in the moment. He realized probably more than anyone else. Because go back a little bit, go back in the story to what just had happened eight days earlier and think about how long people were waiting. Think about shepherds that were grazing their, field, their, their sheep on a hillside and all of a sudden out of nowhere, I don't even know if they'd even ever thought, maybe even in their lifetimes, even knew to expect Messiah. These were simple people, but the angels come and announce that Messiah's arrived. Go and follow. Go to this place and see him now. They had like zero waiting. Sign us up, right? That's how we like to roll. I don't want to wait for anything. The shepherds didn't wait for anything. They just said, here it is, go. Mary, she'd been waiting for months, nine, exactly, for this Jesus to come into this world. Joseph got news a little bit later, so he had a little bit less to wait, but still months of anticipation of Jesus being born. Like we saw in our kids' musical last week, Magi from the East had been traveling months or even more to come and see this new king of the Jews. But I want to draw your attention to Simeon. Simeon had been waiting his whole life. Not just kind of aware of Messiah, you could tell this deep sense of anticipation He'd been leaning forward his whole life, God, when are you going to do it? And once God had said, your eyes will see my promise fulfilled, man, talk about the thrill of hope when he's holding that baby in his arms. That's what I want to talk about today. Take a look in your Trinity this week. You have a card similar to like you did a couple weeks ago. And by the way, that was so profound to see your responses, not only how many of them, if you walked by our Hope display out here on the west wall today of the worship center, you would have seen them. But on top of it, just the honesty, that question, that prompt then was, when I, when I am most aware of my need for hope is... Today we're taking that next step in the story. Your card says, hope arrived in my life. Hope isn't something that I necessarily still dream about. I have realized some realities of hope now. Hope arrived in my life when? We said it a couple weeks ago. We'll give you some time at the end of the service, but there's no right or wrong answer. This is just simply your answer. 
And what I'd love for you to do later in the service, I'd love for you to recount the moment that you realize that there really is hope. Remember biblical hope, not just I hope it's not cold today. Okay, eh, sorry about that. But if my hope is a confidence in the God of the Bible making promises he will fulfill, when did I realize that hope arrived? And today at the end of the service, you can do the same thing. I'd even encourage you, put a name down and come around this outside. We even said last time our, our things were so full. It was awesome, the response. What you'll need to do this week is take out a pen that already has a card and just stick it on top. We'll create a little bit of a narrative over the next couple of weeks by the time we get to Christmas Eve. So we'll do that later on in the service. Now that being the case, let's just pause there for a second. God had done what he had promised for millennia prior to that moment. And what Jesus was going to do was not just enter in, not just God incarnate. Jesus was going to live a sinless life. Jesus was going to die a sacrificial death on behalf of all of humanity. He was the only one qualified for his death to actually have that kind of saving power. And then he would be raised from the dead supernaturally on the third day. This was just the beginning of the story. Jesus was going to accomplish even beyond what people even thought Messiah was here to do. But the reality is that night... That night or that day when Simeon has this moment, think about what happened next. God had arrived. He'd entered into our world. But shepherds went back to the hillsides to tend their sheep. Mary and Joseph would begin the journey of raising a young man, and he would learn the family trade. He was trained to be a carpenter, not a king. Magi, once they had come and seen Jesus they would give him these incredibly symbolic gifts and then they would pack up and go home. And Simeon, once he had seen Jesus, held him in his arms, probably soon thereafter he died. So the reality is, is what really changed? Jesus, it would be another 30 years before Jesus would start doing Jesus-like things that we see in the Gospels. He lived this relatively obscure, just the people around his village in Nazareth knew of him, knew him, but nobody else. And then he would arrive on the scene. He would do incredible miracles that nobody could explain. He would teach as though really he had authority to speak the very words of God. No one had taught like that before, but even in the midst of that, there was still the majority of people he interacted with who said, I'm not still totally convinced. Or altogether, I think you're not who you say you are. And Jesus would have this dissonance with people, meaning they would respond to him poorly, even though he offered himself purely to them. See, the question is, is I have a feeling that for some of us, we've experienced some of that same reality in our own personal journeys. You see, when you came to the understanding that there is a God, a loving God, who created everything around you, when you came to the understanding that there's a break in the relationship, there's a problem with your creator, when you came to the understanding that he did something about it, he didn't wait for you to somehow uh, jump over this chasm, he reached out to you in the giving of his one and only son. And when you learn that that son lived, died, and rose again all to make you right with God so you could be acceptable to him, you knew the thrill of hope. You knew that there is a God and he absolutely extravagantly loves you. But guess what? you had to get up and go to work the next day. You still, if you have children, had kids who don't get along and fight. You still had health problems that weren't miraculously solved in the moment when you came to Christ. You still had financial clouds over your head that weren't gonna go away. You still maybe lived in a marriage that looked a lot more like two-ness and not oneness. You see, all that stuff didn't get solved in the moment that you knew God loves you. His hope was palpable. It was real. And yet you are still here. 
You see, that's what I want to talk about today is not just the fact that hope has been realized in your life, but what do you do in the meantime? How do you live in between what you know and have confidence in is next? You see, there were some things that changed. Prior to responding to the gospel, you did not have the indwelling Holy Spirit in your life. Prior to responding to the gospel, you didn't necessarily believe that the word of God was active and that God himself was speaking to you, the creator of the universe, letting you know who he is and how he rolls. You didn't have a community of believers who are much more than people you sit next to in church or in your home group. You call them brother and sister. All these things were new and added, yet, yet, there's still something in your soul that echoes and says this isn't yet right. This whole thing, as good as it is, the thrill of hope being known still leaves me wanting. And I wanna talk to you today about that wanting and the fact that here's the great news, God told you it would be that way. There's no secrets. And I want to help you, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, wait well. Remember, that's what's changed. You do now have hope. You have the confidence of heaven. This is the verse that we looked at a couple weeks ago, <coughs> excuse me, from Romans chapter 8, verses 24 and 25. We said, this is the point of hope. For in this hope, we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? Hope keeps us looking and leaning forward. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. We wait for it well. Two things I want to walk you through today that I believe will help you wait well. Number one is the reality of inconsolable longing. And the second is the source of living water. That's what I want to talk about. Number two in your notes today, once you've responded to the gospel, you will still have inconsolable longings this side of heaven. Once you respond to the gospel, you will still have inconsolable longings this side of heaven. Let me show you what I mean. I just read to you from Romans 8, back up a couple verses, Romans 8, 22. This is where it says, we know, Paul writing to the church at Rome, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, watch this, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Paul's writing to a church, he's writing as a believer to other believers, we who understand who've been made right with God through Jesus, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. For our adoption to sonship, what does that mean? The next phrase, the redemption of our bodies. Skip the two verses I just read a minute ago, verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. This is one thing I absolutely love about the Bible is that there's no fine print. Now, if your eyes are going bad, the whole Bible's hard to read, so I get that problem. But the Bible's overt, the Bible wants you to know what you need to know to be able to live a life honoring to God, to live a life that's informed in the things that will help you entrust yourself to him. So that's why there's no bait and switch related to the gospel. Paul writing to the church, and what's been going on in Romans is Paul has been building a case of how absolutely eternity changing the gospel is. He's been building this great reality of what God was doing all along and how this gospel has entered in and it changes everything. But then he says in chapter eight, but hold on. In the meantime, as we're waiting forwardly, man, there is some groaning going on, not just around us, but in us. And I believe this is what he's pointing back to. You were created to have unity perfect unity and a perfect connection, both with your creator and with the creation. We see that in Genesis 1 and 2, and we see God placing these two people in this perfect garden, in perfect unity vertically and in perfect unity horizontally. They, it was exactly as God intended. But the reality is this, because God loved these people, he didn't create robots, We've said it before, the only way love can truly be love is if you have the option not to. So God creates an environment where he does, he has to put the tree in the garden 
because Adam and Eve have to have an option to choose not to obey and love him. And we know the story. We know they choose not to. And as a result, everything you have been plunged into in your life bears the marring, bears the reality of a sin-stained world, including your own self. You're welcome. I know, it's like, Todd, wow, what a great, uplifting Christmas message. But the reality is this is in that world, Paul speaks to that, right? He's not just going, we stumble upon something, go, what is happening? Why isn't this as fulfilling as I thought it would be? Paul says, because you're not there yet. Paul says, because you're in between two types of hope. Number one, the hope that's been realized and what Jesus has actually done, and also between the hope of what Jesus has promised is still to come. That kind of unity and connection I mentioned a minute ago is absolutely the stuff of heaven. But not only will we not get to experience it until we get there, but we will continue to long for it in the in-between time. And I would say to you today, and rightly so, rightly so, you are hardwired to have that right relationship with God. You deeply want it. God built you for it. The problem is between here and there. The best way I could think of illustrating that is the fact that of two, type, two different weddings I've done before. I've been in ministry for about 27 years and had the privilege of doing lots of wedding ceremonies, but there are two that will probably stick out in my mind until I die. And they were both related to military couples, both of them actively serving in the case, both of them in the military, in case the other one being military one not. But I was completely surprised the first time I heard about it. And then once I got to the second, months later, I would realize, well, I've seen this before. And it was simply this. We're doing premarital conversations, counseling, and the couple who are both in the military look at me and they go, Todd, something you need to know, we're already married. I said, what? They said, well, for housing purposes, we needed to have a legal wedding, a legal marriage, so that they would station us in the same place. And this happened months before they actually got married. So by the, the state of Alaska, in this case, this was this couple, they were absolutely legally married. But then they looked at me and they said, Todd, we may be married on paper, but we have not yet had that celebration with our family and friends. And so we have not been together yet. I just remember looking them in the face and being so proud of them because they wanted their anniversary that they are celebrating every year was that time in March when we got together at the country club and it rained all day long. That's the wedding they want to remember because that is when before God, it was the weirdest wedding. I didn't have a marriage certificate for anyone to sign at the end. It was done. But in the in-between time, rightfully, appropriately so, they were longing for when they actually got to live like married people. To me, that's a great illustration of what's happened for us. If you've responded to the gospel, you have been entered into the body of Christ, entered into the family of God. The Bible will even say you are a part of the bride of Christ who is waiting for the marriage supper of the lamb when the wedding ceremony actually gets to be celebrated. You're living in between. And you have all the right types of anticipation, all the right kind of longing because you were built to want that. The problem is there's time and space in between. And the reality is like Paul says, there's some groaning that's gonna happen. I'm not telling you something you didn't already know. I know you know that. I know that you know you live in a broken place, but I wanna talk about a little bit today of what do we do with that groaning, what do we do when we groan and we really want that to stop? Let me show you what I mean in your notes. In the in-between time, there is a groaning, there is an expected disconnect between what has been accomplished and yet what we still have to live with as a forgiven people on a broken planet. There is a tension that we constantly live in. There is a groaning, as Paul says in Romans 8. And here's where the problem arises. It's not so much that you didn't know that. I'm not speaking into your life something new today. Todd, are you kidding? I'm going to have problems? As a Christian, there's going to be troubles and hardships? Wow, thank you. I know you knew that, but here's where the problem is. 
The problem is, is when we get in our mind expectations of, God, I shouldn't be having to go through this. God, this sequence of hardships and trials is pointless. God, this is not the abundant life I signed up for. I have a feeling that though you know the theory of living in a place that's groaning, I think you can relate to what I just said because you've walked in those shoes. And what was really helpful to me was being reminded of some of these things. I think I've known theoretically, but forgot practically. What does that mean? I picked up a book that I remember reading uh, on a college summer missions trip called Inside Out by Larry Crabb. And I picked it up a few months ago because I wanted to reread a section and I realized this is the revised and updated version I didn't have 28 years ago. And I remembered as I was rereading it, there was some stuff in the foreword that I think really caught my attention on this topic. He begins talking about what Jesus said in John 10.10. Look at the screen. Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I, Jesus talking about himself, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. You might have a version of the Bible you're looking at that says that they might have abundant life. That's another phrase that can be interchanged with that. I've come that they might have abundant life. And what what happens all too often though, here's where the problem erupts, is when we insert our own definition of what the word abundant means. Abundant means I shouldn't have these financial hardships. Abundant means I shouldn't have this health issue. God, I'm one of the good guys. I'm on your team. I look at my coworker, I look at my neighbor, they're completely godless. Look at the things they enjoy. Why is this happening to me? That's when we get this sideways. Look how Dr. Crabb puts it. He said, Jesus lived an abundant life, a life abundant in trials and sorrows a life abundant in difficulties and pain, a life abundant in rejection and loneliness that could only be endured through communion with his father, and watch this, and with a hope for a better day in a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus knew nothing of what so many of us call abundant and believe we are supposed to receive from him. That's a pretty telling statement. And I read that and I see myself in those words. God, this shouldn't be happening to me. This isn't a part of that abundant life you came to bring, and yet I'm having to walk in this. What's going on? And that's when we get sideways. That's when we go living with the tension isn't just a tension anymore. I'm swinging the pendulum this way to angst. I'm frustrated. I have a deep longing. It is not being met, and I don't know what to do with this. One of the things I want to help you with today is the deep longing that we're referring to is far deeper than comfort. It's far deeper than not having financial stress. It's far deeper than not having health problems. It's something that you were built for. You were built for a perfect relationship with a perfect God, and that is absolutely broken at this time. And so in the midst of it, What I want to help you with today is what do I do with those inconsolable longings? And we see it through the life and the example like you'd expect of Jesus. Crabb says this later, because of the other-centered life of Jesus, because of the self-sacrificing death of Jesus, and because of the life-giving resurrection of Jesus, we can now live the abundant life of Jesus. How? Which centers on a way of relating to God and others that is energized by the other-centered the self-sacrificing, the life-giving passion of Jesus, a way of relating in the power of the Holy Spirit that reveals the holy love of the Father the way Jesus did. So there is a pathway to living well, to waiting well in the midst of the tension of what isn't right yet, and it's simply as we read the Gospels and we read the life and example of Jesus, it's to live that other-centered, that self-sacrificing, that life-giving life of Jesus both vertically to God and horizontally with others. There is a pathway to not having the tension become angst and disappointment, but instead stay in the reality. It's not there yet, but I'm absolutely convinced it's going to be, and I'm going to live intentionally in light of it. 
Finally, he says this, we live every day with inconsolable longings that God built into us, desires that will never be fully satisfied until we live in the next world. We were designed to live as part of, watch this, a perfect community in a perfect world as perfectly loving people. Man, what a far cry, right? And that's the design, but it's not what you and I know. That longed for reality does not exist now. It doesn't exist now, but here's where we draw from the idea and the thrill of hope is that's what New Testament hope has always been about. It's always been looking forward. That's why I say it's fascinating as we look at Christmas every year, there are some powerful things we can relate to to a people who are looking forward to Jesus' first arrival as we wait for his second. Look at some of these passages that talk about hope in the New Testament. 1 Peter 1.13, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope, what, on the grace to be brought to you when? When Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. That's where my hope is, and that's when that happens is when Jesus is revealed, not in this life. Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope, what? To which he has called you, which hope? That the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people. I pray you'd see and focus and fixate on the hope that's to come when we're adopted into the family of God and surrounding the throne. That's what we look forward to. Finally, today in your notes, number three, in the midst of your ache for what only heaven can provide, stay clear from filling that space with anything but Jesus. In the midst of your ache for what only heaven can provide, stay clear from filling that space with anything less than Jesus. I wanna take you back to the former covenant to the prophet Jeremiah. He says this in Jeremiah 2.13. This is God, actually, he says, Write these words down, Jeremiah. This is God speaking. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So I had the privilege and the invitation this last summer to speak at a men's entry point event uh, for another church. And it's a total great event. It's very thoughtful. Here at Trinity, what do we do for men? We blow stuff up, and then there they eat barbecue, right? just makes sense, right? It's a real man thing. So it was a men's barbecue dinner thing, and and I knew that they were going to do a great job inviting friends from their relational world who did not know Jesus yet, who had not yet responded to the gospel. That was the total purpose of the event. So I started thinking in my mind, God, what could I say I'm thinking primarily of not so much the guys, but who they invited, their friends. What could I say that would be helpful and relatable to a group of men who haven't yet responded to the gospel? Where do we start? Where do we build a bridge? And the one thought that came to my mind as I was preparing was the fact of thirst. I think something they could relate to, something I could relate to. I have been a a thirsty man ever since I was young. And when I'm talking about thirst, you know I'm not talking about a physical thirst. I'm talking about a soulish thirst. I've desperately wanted more. Maybe not the accumulation of more, but just something more meaningful all my life. And so I got up to present this. I was thinking about it that week and going to share it. And, And I was thinking about this group of guys, and I was thinking, though, about some interesting factors. I was thinking I was talking to a group of men who haven't yet, the ones I was targeting, who haven't yet responded to the gospel, who haven't yet known experientially the God of love who is love, who hadn't yet known what it is to be forgiven for decades of living their own way and in sin. I was talking to a group of men who had never experienced the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And as I was preparing all that, then I asked this key question. So why am I still thirsty? You see, all those things were true of me. It was a great bridge to talk to a group of guys that I knew, I knew because I know all human beings are wired with these same inconsolable longings. I knew I could connect to them, but then my math was, what's my problem? Because I'm not going to talk about what it means to be thirsty decades ago and what God did and now it's all great and we're awesome. I'm talking about how I'm doing today. In your notes, 
now that I've come to know Jesus, is it makes sense? Is there a problem that I'm still thirsty? Now that I've come to know Jesus, is there a problem with the fact that I'm still thirsty? Should I be thirsty anymore now that I have Jesus? You see, that was really a, a powerful thing. It just popped off the page as I was typing and getting ready for this message and asking the question, what, what is up with that? You see, it's not a sense of, do I not know? I love this passage right from Romans 10, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what? You will be saved. I think there are a host of people in this room that would say, I absolutely not just believe that statement, I've, I'm in. Like I have responded to that invitation of the gospel. And yet when we talk about your everyday life, when we talk about my everyday life, we ask the question, so, but what's the problem with it's great news to know that my life is not on a collision course for an eternity apart from God anymore, but how am I getting through the day? What am I looking to to be that thing that fills a space I already know only Jesus can fill? How am I living every day in light of the reality of not just the hope that's been realized, but the hope that's on delay? What am I putting in the space that God built me to only know and enjoy from him? You see, we could begin to take answers around the room today. And if we're honest with ourselves, some of us would say, if I'm honest, it's probably the track on my career that I'm looking to fill that space. If I'm honest, it's my family. And having healthy relationships and putting these people real close by, that gives me, the, I'm trying, it's not working. Some of us would say addictive behaviors and attitudes. Some of us would say porn. Some of us would say money and wealth. Some of us would say, on the list goes. But there is something, and we know better. It's not a question of what you know. It's simply a question of God every day. What am I saying? I believe this will fill that space. And what you and I have experienced time and time again is it never does. That's the definition of an idol. An idol can never perform. It can never satisfy in the way only the one true living God can. So in the space in between, when I realize there's something missing, what am I putting in that place? You see, Jeremiah talking on God's behalf to the people of Israel, this is what God said. You have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and you have dug your own cisterns, broken ones at that. Real quick on that, a spring of living water, it's exactly what you think it is. It's something discoverable. And once it's discovered, it not only gives me enough water for today or in this moment, man, it keeps providing, it keeps, and it's not only water for me, it's water for my whole family, it's water for everyone I bring in contact with it. This is good news. This is what God offers himself to be, a spring of living water to us. But instead, like the people of Israel, we've said, no, thank you, we're gonna go over here and dig a hole. Because that's what a cistern is. It's a big hole in the ground to meant to hold or to keep water. It's not the source of water. It just holds it. But the problem is, not only did I dig a hole, I dig a hole, I dug a hole that was actually broken. It leaks. It doesn't accomplish anything that it's supposed to. We've forsaken the source of living water and exchanged it for a broken can. We keep seeing this in our lives. That's the power when Jesus says in John 7, he fulfills these words, by the way, from Jeremiah. This is what he says, John 7, 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and he said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from them. What a powerful passage, Jesus reminding them, I am the source. 
I recognize your thirst. I'm calling thirsty people, but I'm not calling them to come to some facade or some make-up version. I'm calling them to me because I'm the only one that can fill that space. Crabb talks about crucial longings. He says it this way, we were designed to live in a relationship with someone unfailingly strong and lovingly involved who enables us to fulfill the important jobs he assigns. Without relationship or impact, life is profoundly empty. Nothing, not imperfect friends, not impressive work, not excitement, not pleasure, can fulfill that hollow core except what we were built to experience. Nothing can satisfy our crucial longings except the kind of relationship that only God offers. So I want to close by making it simple today. I don't have time to walk out. We'll do it in the future. But for today, let me just leave it this way. If you are here and you haven't yet responded to this amazing invitation that the creator of the universe didn't wait for you to get your act together, he came to you in the person of Jesus. And he did live a sinless life. He did die a sacrificial death. He did raised supernaturally from the third day, on the third day. He did all of that for you. And your response begins like it does every single week at Trinity by A, admitting that you're a sinner who needs a savior. B, believing Jesus is the only savior available. And C, choosing not to put your confidence in yourself, your morality, or religion, but choosing to put your confidence in the accomplished work of Jesus. You may also be here today and you would say, but Todd, I've already done that. But when I'm honest with myself, there are a lot of other things I am trying to jam into that place. Always unsatisfying, always failing, but I seem to keep trying. I wanna give you hope and I wanna give you one practical step to at least begin that journey. Look at the prayer I wrote for you on your notes. It's on the screen. Jesus, I'm thirsty. Just admitting what he already knows. Jesus, I'm thirsty. Let me look to you alone to be the one who satisfies that thirst. A breathing, reminding prayer. Jesus, I'm thirsty. Let me look to you alone to be the only one who can satisfy that thirst. Jesus, I'm thirsty. Let me look to you alone to be the only one who can satisfy that thirst. That's where I believe it at least begins. My hope is that you would know that kind of reality in the middle between hope realized and yet hope delayed. Let me pray. Father, I want to say thank you. Thank you that you have completed the promises that you made in the person of Jesus, not just his arrival, but everything about what he accomplished. And Father, thank you as well that you have made promises to us that we in the same way are learning to wait well, learning to look forward to the fact, and as we realize that we have inconsolable longings, as we realize that we have crucial longings that we're trying to fill with anything but you, God, bring these things to surface so that we can live the truly abundant life Jesus came to bring. Understanding the right definition of the word abundant. Thank you that you didn't just provide a way to save us for eternity, but you provided a mechanism for us to be right in the present to keep Jesus at the center. And I pray indeed for all of my friends here today, for me, God, would we keep looking to you to be what only you can be. Father, we love you. Thank you for this Christmas season. And we pray in Jesus' great name, amen. I told you about the card that was in your Trinity this week. We're gonna give you a moment right now. I just want you to fill that out, just like you did a couple weeks ago. Just use that prompt, hope arrived in my life when? And after the service today, if you just go out around these doors on the west wall, you'll see the big hope letters. Take one of those stick pins and push it in and let us just create this narrative over the course of our Christmas season. Not just when we knew we needed hope, but when it showed up.
inside me wants to hide is a shadow an angel or a warrior if god is pleased with me reminded as we worshiped as uh, Todd was speaking just the one of the reasons that we gather is to just give all of our affections to God to put Jesus in that first place in our lives and just remind us he deserves that place and so we're going to continue to proclaim together the name of Jesus there's no name no other name he was given for us and as we do, the ushers are going to come forward, receive the offerings. Let's worship the Lord together as we close our time.
together, God, we thank you for the gift that we celebrate, that we receive at Christmas, Lord, the gift of your son, Jesus. Thank you for the reminder, Lord, that our hope is as sure as anything in this world. And yet, Father, it takes that 
day by day, living by faith, trusting you with those things in our hearts and in our lives that are yet unrealized. That's why we need hope, God. And so we put our hope in you. Help us to keep you at that first place, Lord, in our lives and to honor you in that way as we go out from this place. Thank you for this time that we could share together in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great rest of your day. Don't forget to pin your hope card outside. And don't uh, forget there's a prayer team here who would love to pray with you this morning. God bless.